try anything you cancel, bro. The f did you say to me, you little shit? So I just watched the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre on Netflix, and it was really bad. Obviously, it's never going to live up to the original movie from 1974, but this is easily one of the worst additions to this franchise to date, and the fact that it tied itself to that film by reintroducing us to Sally, the sole survivor of the original film, in her mission to kill Leatherface, and whilst basically ripping off the same plot as Halloween, just goes to show that the director had no integrity or respect for what made the original so great. I, I just can't. Take no pleasure in killing. This film is lazy, it's obnoxious, and is heavily relying on kill scenes and gore which are even overshadowed by the extremely unlikable cast, poorly written plot which ignores any form of basic logic sometimes, and a setting that fails to establish any form of synergy with the serious tone the movie so heavily implies on itself. They almost romanticise Leatherface instead of just letting the character speak for himself, and then there's some boring social commentary that feels forced into the plot for the sake of reasons, I guess. I do, however, like the cinematography. I think it's shot really well. The colour palette offers a nice aesthetic at times, although the teal and orange colour grade is getting kind of old now. But overall, the movie is quite simply forgettable. Now, going into this movie, I really wasn't expecting much. As soon as I seen that it was a Netflix feature, I just, I just rolled my eyes and thought, oh God, here we go. <laughs> and my suspicions were right. In the first two minutes, we're absolutely graced with the presence of our two main protagonists, Melody and Lila, in what has to be one of the worst ways to introduce them to the audience. Just take a look at the scene here. So they've pulled into this gas station to pick up some dino nuggies and a juice box. There's some quick exposition, and then the two sisters go back to the car where we quickly get introduced to the other characters. They're pretty forgettable, so I wouldn't really worry about them too much. All of a sudden, their conversation is brought to a halt by a dude pulling in to get some fuel, and he's a real manly man. Just a guy being a dude. Beard, gun on hip, blasting metal as he pulls in, and he's rocking the flanny and singlet combo. And this is what I mean when I say that these main characters are insufferable. This guy, which we'll see again later, did nothing wrong, man. Sure, he may have been playing his music a little bit too loud, but Jesus, you're in the middle of tit-ass nowhere and fucking Susan Boyle and token black guy over here act like he's just killed someone. Look at this guy. Who has such a small dick they need to walk around in public with a fucking gun? Like... Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, lady, chill out. My boy has just minded his own business, and as rude as you are, he's keeping his cool and being very polite, you insufferable witch. Sharp, big gun makes you uncomfortable. I've seen bigger. Anyways, that's enough of that horrible intro. Let's get on with the movie. So this is a basic summary of the plot. Set 50 years after the events of the 1974 film, the story is a direct sequel to the original where we follow a group of young Gen Z influencers or entrepreneurs, I guess. <laughs> Melody, who we already had the privilege of meeting. Dante, Lila, who was a school shooting survivor, more on that later. And Ruth, who seek to renovate or auction off old properties or something in the abandoned town of Harlow in Texas to create a trendy, new age, heavily gentrified area. And guess who just so happens to be chilling in that very same town? What? No way. It's Spooky Chainsaw Man. After about 30 seconds of being in Harlow, Susan Boyle and King Buck, or whatever the f*** that vine guy is, are responsible for giving the sweet old lady called Ginny, which is Leatherface's mother or carer, I guess, a heart attack by wrongfully accusing her of dodging an eviction notice. Wish I'd known you all coming. I'd put my face on. Do you guys get it? Put my face on? Like how Leatherface wears a mask? Guys, do you get it? Ugh, fucking hell, dude. She's quickly put in the car with the blonde girl who just insists she goes with them to the hospital for some reason. Like, you could have just stayed. It, it, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a shitty thing that's happened, but there's no reason for you to go. Just stay in Harlow. It, it makes no sense for you to go with the police. And Leatherface is going along for the ride too, obviously. Let's. Leatherface's mum dies on the way to the hospital. He's pissed, proceeds to slaughter old mate in the car. Driver gets shot, they crash, no surprise there. Blonde girl pretends to play dead while Leatherface cuts off his own mother's face to wear as his new mask. 
This scene, I think, is actually pretty cool. It's shot well. I like the shot of him slowly peeking his head up over the sunflowers, and the idea that he just cut off his mother's face and is now wearing it is pretty metal but it still goes against who Leatherface is. He typically only wears the face of his victims and making him deface his mother like that now just feels like a cheap gimmick for shock value. The mask is an icon to the character and they've even managed to mess that up in this movie. Anyway, blonde girl dies. We never hear anything about her again, so who cares? And Leatherface makes his way back to Harlow. I'm fast as fuck, boy. <laughs> still fast as fuck, boy. Come get Meanwhile, while all this is happening, Lila strikes up a conversation with their contractor, Richter, who we met at the beginning. So, Richter, why are you such a nihilist? The fuck you say to me? <laughs> Jesus Christ, lady, who the fuck taught you how to converse with people? If I were this guy, I'd just say fuck the money, dude, and just bail on you and your ungrateful, stuck up friends. Lila wastes no time explaining to Richter that she's a survivor of a school shooting, so I guess they're friends now? I don't fucking know, dude. The pacing of this movie is very weird. Melody checks her phone to see that the old lady died, decides that she's too good of a person to continue with this project now that she's partially responsible for her death and wants to leave with her sister. Richter gets wind of them killing Leatherface's mum and decides to not let them leave until they can give him proof that they have the deed to the building. So Melody and Dante go back to the orphanage to see if Ginny in fact owned the house. She does. Next minute, Leatherface has somehow managed to make it back to the orphanage in what seems like 10 minutes, which is fucking impressive for a guy his size, dude. Anyway, ignoring that little plot convenience, Dante quickly gets one tapped and Melody proceeds to hide. Dante actually survives long enough to walk outside where he's found by Richter, who then goes to investigate the orphanage but is met with a sledgehammer to the knee and face dead. Sally is finally introduced to us by seeing her gunning a pig. Yummy. She's been made aware that Leatherface has in fact been right under her nose this whole time. Good work, Lou. You'll make sergeant for this. Uh, I already am sergeant chief. That's some good detective work right there. Haven't you been hunting him for like 30 to 40 years? I know he's been wearing a mask, but Jesus, man, modern technology is pretty remarkable these days, and I'm sure there aren't many people that fit his description, let alone in the isolated area of Texas. Anyway, ignoring that little nitpick, Sally sets off on her revenge. Coming back to Melody, who is still hiding under the bed, she tries to creep out of the house, which has the world's most creakiest floorboards in it, apparently. And then we're treated to the second best scene in the whole entire movie. <laughs> Man, I could watch that on a repeat all day. Holy hell, that chainsaw is performing well, considering it hasn't been started in over 30 years. It's even cutting through a goddamn metal pipe. Moving on again, Melody and Lila run back to the bus where this dude just... He just has to be given this line, doesn't he? Try anything you cancel, bro. Try anything you cancel, bro. This might just be the boomer inside of me, but I can't stand when movies are throwing all these pop culture terms in ways that are just so unfunny and forced. That's one of the main things I didn't like about Free Guy. Leatherface thankfully carves through everyone in that bus, which reminded me of that scene from Invincible, which is pretty cool. I actually kind of like the contrast of blue here. Melody and Lila manage to escape and run into Sally, who has just arrived, drunk on a mission to kill Leatherface, which leads her to leave the sisters locked in the back of the police car as bait while she walks off into the darkness alone. I know you're on a mission here, lady, but Jesus, man, you know what this man is capable of, so you should know that this isn't a good idea. I can't really be too annoyed here because that's just another typical horror movie trope, but still, there's a line that shouldn't be crossed when it comes to that. Sally has been obsessing over killing Leatherface for like 50 years. Even if she was drunk with obsession, she should still be smart about it. They've portrayed her as a strong woman with leadership qualities, so you'd think she would be more methodical and tactical about her approach just like they were with the Halloween movie. You're already basically ripping off that movie, so you may as well go whole hog anyway, but no. You have all this build up for her to get a chainsaw through the fucking chest after whiffing like 48 shots from point blank range with a shoddy. Good job, lady. 50 years well spent right there. <laughs> Hang on, what, what the fuck was that sass right there, dude? Mm -hmm. The 
I told you. Mm -hmm. The women crash. No surprise there. Lila then proceeds to escape the wreck and grab a gun. The girl that the movie has been very on the nose about being anti-gun picks up a gun and attempts to use it. Good one, film. And don't try and tell me that that's her being brave for overcoming a fear in order to save her sister, because that's fucking bullshit. <laughs> oh, get the fuck out of here, dude. This woman just took a fucking chainsaw to the heart not even five minutes ago, and you're telling me she's still alive? Jesus, man. I know horror movies defy logic, but that is just ridiculous. This is that defiance of basic logic I talked about at the beginning. The final fight scene is just nonsensical too. So as a quick summary, Lila wields a shotgun and follows Leatherface into a building where she gets outplayed by 200 IQ bait. But instead of Leatherface just running at her and bloody snapping her neck or smacking the gun out of her hands, for some reason he tackles her into the pool of water. Lila obviously gets out, woo, didn't see that coming, and is almost killed until her sister somehow manages to get out of the car wreck where her leg was impaled, and then proceeds to temporarily overpower this 7 foot tall, 120 kilogram dude. Righto. Lila gives Leatherface the old double pump before Melody comes in for the final blow with the most with, with the most pathetic excuse for a chainsaw swing. Uh, this movie makes me irrationally angry, dude. You had a million ways you could have killed him right there and you chose to give him a little kiss on the chin. In typical horror movie fashion, they just assume he's dead after inflicting about 20 damage to him and then they leave. Lila then thinks it's a good idea to take Sally's hat. Isn't that weird? Why would you take a hat from a dead lady you just met? You don't know her. Maybe someone else would like that hat. They probably need it for evidence anyway. I don't know why this annoys me so much, but it's just a weird thing to do that makes no sense at all. Remember before when I said we were treated to the second best scene in the movie? Well, here's the best scene. As they're leaving, Leatherface returns from the gulag and cuts off Melody's head. Thank Christ she's finally dead. As their Tesla is on autopilot driving away, the movie tries to give one final nod to the original by having Leatherface do his little dance thing he does with a chainsaw. Too little too late movie. That doesn't make up for shit. There's also a post credit scene that implies there's going to be a sequel, which I just... God, I just, I just can't wait for that. So is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre worth your time? Absolutely not. It's not even a movie I'd put on in the background while I look at my phone. Although the movie was shot beautifully and the acting wasn't terrible, the film failed to encapsulate any sense of dread or ambience that worked alongside Leatherface's character. It felt very cheap, lazy, and self-indulgent. 